Welcome in this video, we are going to focus on real-time rendering of North. Uh, we are going to implement the very great uh, Planoc tree paper that allows real-time rendering uh, on that, uh, as the name suggests, is, uh, is based on the North tree based representation. These are the results we will get by, this, uh, by the end of this video, so uh, that allows rendering much more faster than vanilla North uh, on uh, while keeping a very good uh, accuracy, uh, so a uh, very great rendering quality. I will put a link of the code in the description. Uh, if you do use the code or if you find it useful, please leave a star on this GitHub repository and a thumbs up on this channel, it's always helpful. And also, do not forget to subscribe uh, for more content related to Nerf. Okay, that being said, let's dive into the implementation. Uh, we are going to implement the paper in about uh, 100 lines of code and we are going to use PyTorch uh, as usual in this channel. We are also going to use uh, Matplotlib uh, on NumPy uh, as helpers uh, yeah, that will be helpful for implementing a few of your functions. So we can start by implementing a function that will, uh, so given theta and phi, uh, so spherical coordinate system, they will move them uh, into a Cartesian coordinate system. So it will convert theta and phi, uh, theta and phi to uh, x, y, z. Uh, on we assume that the radius is equal to one. Uh, so based based on a given uh, on the angles theta and phi, uh, we get the uh, the position in a sphere of radius one. I will explain in a moment what, uh, why we need this function. We can also implement the North model. Um, so the head of the uh, Planoc tree pipeline is uh, is just a, a basic North, so just a MLP uh, that uh, with a positional encoding. So uh, with a MLP, uh, a first block, block one, block two. Uh, there is a second block because we need to do skip connection, as in the uh, initial North paper. Um, the block two will predict uh, some hidden features as well as the density for the uh, so predicting density as well as the hidden feature for the following block, and then with the block three and block four, but this time the MLP will will predict the uh, spherical basis. So in the paper these are named uh, K. So we have an, um, we have the uh, the plane tree pipeline. We take as input the the position, then the North model will, will predict the density on the coefficients K. Uh, and then we will use those coefficients k to compute the color that will be direction dependent. And we do that so that uh, all those values, all those uh, density values and those uh, k values can be cached in a, uh, in a plane of tree or uh, in an appropriate data structure. Uh, and therefore, the, the dimension of the data structure is only three x, y, z. Uh, while caching the 5D, uh, the 5D data is uh, will, ta will, ta will take. Uh, uh, too much memory. Um, so yeah, we decouple the position on the uh, direction to as much as possible so that we can, uh, this allows uh, real-time rendering. So we'll see in a moment how to compute, how to, to, to combine those coefficients, so those um, those 75 values uh, with, the uh, with the direction to predict the color. So we'll see that in a moment, but uh, long, long story short, uh, the North model will predict the uh, some k some coefficients instead of the uh, instead of the color directly. Okay, so now that we uh, have our MLP that will predict the coefficients k, uh, we can uh, store the uh, some variables for the North model. Uh, so basically the uh, uh, the dimension of the positional encoding, and we can we also have two additional learnable parameters that is the bandwidth and p. Um, okay, maybe I will explain them now uh, rather than later. So if we go into the appendix, so basically that will explain to us uh, all the coefficients k uh, are combined with the direction to compute the uh, the, the color. Uh, there are two ways to do that, to implement the spherical basis function. We can either do spherical harmonics or spherical Gaussians. In our case, we will uh, focus on spherical uh, Gaussians. So in the paper, they, uh, um, they study uh, both of them. Um, they, they, both of them have different uh, number of components. So, for example, if you have a look at the figures, uh, SG25, it, it means the spherical Gaussians with 25 components. This is the one we will implement in the paper, uh, in this uh, in this code, uh, on the, in this video. Uh, so you can have a look at those curves if you want to really see the performance um, in in, uh, in opposition to spherical Gaussians with more components or to uh, spherical harmonics. Um, they explain, uh, yeah, they do an ablation. Uh, you can, uh, for example, they explain that switching between um, SH16 and SH25 makes very little difference. 
and they also, uh, I think, in some point in the paper, they compare SH to SG. But anyway, so why do we explain uh, spherical Gaussians? So for spherical harmonics, there are a few uh, a few values that you need to hard code. Um, they are predefined. You need to hard code them in your code. Uh, that's not complicated, but that's a bit tedious. You need to go over the internet to retrieve the coefficients and to put them in your code. Um, on while spherical Gaussians, all the components are learnable. So we have uh, the parameters lambda, that's the bond width, on P, uh, that uh, belongs to R2. Uh, and basically, we have only those parameters and we need to learn them. So much more, it's much easier to, to, to implement. So there is no uh, feature engineering. Uh, while for spherical Gaussians, you need to, uh, to compute those coefficients. But of course, you can retrieve them over the internet. So again, okay, let's focus on spherical Gaussians. So with the bond width, um, that belongs to R1. The, uh, the lobe axis, P, that belongs to R2. Uh, and basically, this is what we implement in the code. So with the bond width, uh, this is one value, one value uh, the parameter P, there are, uh, there are two values on those dimensions are 25. So why 25? Because we have 25 components. So basically, for each K predicted by the neural network, we will do this sum. So basically, N will go up to 25. So for each component k, there will be uh, we will do this computation. So basically, there will be a value lambda on d for each of the 25 components. Um, so yeah, so 25. On k, in our case, k belongs to R3. So there are 25 kl components. So 3 times 25 is equal to 75. And this is why the neural network is predicting 25 components. So let's come back to our equation. So k will be predicted by the neural network. On GL, so we will co uh, co um, will combine the uh, the the coefficients k predicted by the neural network that are only position dependent. So we'll be able to cache them on G. Uh, so G will be dependent on some parameters that are uh, global and that are learnable with the direction. Um, yeah. So so that means that at at uh, when you need to do the rendering. K is a new data structure. You can retrieve it in. Uh, you can retrieve it in O of one operation. On GL is only a few computations um, that are very fast, and therefore you, you uh, can achieve real time rendering. Okay, so let's go back in the code. So we have the uh, the parameter bandwidth, the P, so the lobe axis. Then you can implement positional encoding. So uh, the initial positional encoding uh, proposed in the vanilla North paper. So very easy, very standard, very common. And now we can move to the fraud function. So first we do the positional encoding. So we map uh, the positions to higher dimensional space. Uh, we send the, um, the embedded uh, position into uh, the first block. Then on the second block, and we do a skip connection. So we concatenate again the hidden feature with the, uh, the, um, the, the positional uh, encoded. So the, the position encoded. Uh, and then we extract sigma from the, uh, from the value predicted by the block two. And then from H, we compute the coefficients K. Now that we have K, we can, um, we can compute the color. So basically, we are just, I'm just computing the equations from the paper. So that was the exponential of the boundaries multiplied by P times D minus 1. So if we go back uh, in the paper, just implementing this equation, and then we do need to do multiplication with K, and then taking the sum of all this. So if I go back in the code, we do the... Uh, yeah, we just implement this equation, so k times the exponential, so that was called g, and then we take the sum. So now let's come back to our Carti two Cartesian function. So basically in the paper, p belongs to R2, because we assume that the direction uh, is uh, parameterized by theta on phi. So in most paper, the direction is, uh, is, is written as theta on phi, but in all code-based, Basically, the direction will uh, we parameterize it as x, y, z. So, in theory, in the paper, the direction belongs to R two. Uh, in practice, in the uh, paper implementations, the direction belongs to R three. So, basically, what we need to do to be able to do this this multiplication, d times p. So, if we go back to the paper, d times p, uh, p needs to belong to R three. So, what we do. As p belongs to R2, first we do a, a, a conversion. We convert it to a Cartesian coordinate system because d is as well is a coordinate uh, in a Cartesian coordinate system, so that you can do the multiplication. Okay, so uh, just uh, 
just a, a, a tiny uh, a tiny addition because of this uh, of this parameterization of the direction. And now that we've the north model or the north model or created uh, everything else everything else will will be related to any uh, north code base uh, we might have. So uh, if you follow my channel, you are uh, you are aware of most of the uh, other functions. First, a testing function. So given uh, an image index, uh, we retrieve uh, on the data set the origin and direction of this uh, of the rays for this image that we are uh, doing the test on. And then we will do batching to predict the... Uh, because we cannot uh, predict all the pixels of the image at, at the same time, because it will, uh, it will produce a CUDA out of memory, uh, unless we have a very good uh, GPU, we will uh, produce um, the, the pixel of the image chuck by chuck. So basically we are doing batching. Um, so yeah, this is what we do. We uh, get the uh, batch origin and direction. We uh, do a rendering. So we'll implement the render array functions in a moment. You, we get our regenerated pixel values, and then we can uh, append them in a list. And then we, uh, we will uh, reform the image uh, based on this list, uh, do the reshaping on plot the image. Okay, so this is the testing function, uh, rather easy. Um, we can now move on to implementing the rendering function. Before doing the rendering function, we can implement a helper function. So the function that will compute the accumulated transmittance. Um, so basically, this is TI in the initial nerve paper. Uh, once you have the equations uh, in front of you, it's pretty easy to understand this. Uh, I will not dive into the uh, details of that. Uh, I have an, a course about nerve uh, in case you are interested and you want to learn more about the equations. Uh, the link will be in the description. Okay, now that we have this function, computer accumulated transmittance, we can move on to the rendering function. So we take as input our model. So our 3D representation of the scene, uh, we get the origins of the ray. So basically the rays we want to uh, to do the rendering on. So we get the origin on direction, and then the near and far plane, HN, HF, on the number of bins we want to use to approximate uh, the line integral. Um, so number of bins we'll use to do the uh, quadrature. Okay, we can start by sampling uh, some t uh, along the ray. So basically that will help us to sample points along the ray to compute the quadrature. Then we do perturb sampling. So we will perturb uh, the, the, the values t sampled. Uh, otherwise we'll always sample uh, the same points in 3D and that can lead to overfitting. So we do perturb sampling to avoid overfitting. We also, also compute delta. So the difference between two successive t uh, on that will be helpful to compute the quadrature. Okay, now that we have those values t, we can sample uh, 3D points along the rays. Uh, so for a given, a given ray t, uh, this position at time t is its origin plus t times d. So we compute the origin, uh, uh, the position uh, along the rays, and then we reshape the direction so that it will have the same shape as x. Now that we have, uh, for each uh, point x, we have its associated direction, so they have the same shape, we can send them to the north model and we will get for each of them the color on the sigma. So uh, basically, you can plug any nerf model uh, you want, as long as it's returning the color on the uh, density uh, for, uh, for a pair of um, position and direction, this rendering function will work fine. So you can uh, replace this nerf model by vanilla nerf, uh, or basically you can implement more complex things there, but the rendering function will work just fine. Now that we have the color on the, uh, on the density, we can uh, compute, uh, basically, all this is just the rendering function, so the volumetric rendering integral um, from the, uh, from the uh, initial north paper. Well, they, they did not invent this, uh, this function, of course. They are coming from much, uh, um, from a much older paper. Uh, but yeah, they are nicely written uh, on define in the initial north paper from 2020. We're adding this term. Um, so basically, in theory, we should just return c, but we are also adding plus one minus weight sum. So basically, this is a regularization for white background. Uh, this all explained in my course, but long story short, uh, when wh when uh, with uh, synthetic data, we have the, the background that is white. Maybe I can uh, move there. So for example, this background is white. So that means that all this is empty. So in theory, if we shoot away there, um, the, the density should be equal to zero everywhere. So if we go back, so this value sigma, because it's empty, it should be zero everywhere. 
so therefore the color of this uh, of the background should be black but we ask the north model by uh, when we do when we feed uh, those those uh, those pixels in the data loader for example we ask the north model to predict a white background there so to predict a white value so value of one that means that we give um, we, we give a, in the North model a predict that uh, a problem that cannot be solved because we ask the model okay this should be empty this should be it should be black but at the same time you want uh, we want it to be uh, white so we do we add this term so basically when uh, weight sum so basically when there is no density when it's empty when the, the weights are equal to zero uh, we do plus one so that means that we have one minus zero we do the plus one on the uh, black becomes white. Uh, on uh, when this is the opposite, when weight sum is equal to one, when uh, we're, we're uh, touching uh, something that is opaque, like uh, like this, there is a lot of density. So weight sum is equal to one. Uh, we do one plus one, so it doesn't change anything. But for the uh, for the background, uh, we uh, we switch from black to white, uh, which is very useful. So very important term. Otherwise, we ask the North model to uh, solve something that is very uh, that is not uh, solvable. Okay, now we can move to the training function. So we take, uh, basically it's just supervised learning uh, for each pixel with the target value. And then we will do some predictions. <coughs> and we'll just compare the prediction with the ground truth, uh, take the MSC loss and then do a gradient step. So we can uh, prepare a, a list to log the training loss over time. Uh, we can iterate over the number of epochs and then we'll iterate over each batch in our data loader so we'll uh, first fetch the origin direction and go through pixel values uh, and then um, we so we have our target on line 118 then we can uh, do the rendering so uh, compute our prediction and then take the msc loss between the prediction and the ground truth uh, and then do a gradient step on the loss if we have a scheduler, we can do a step um, to decrease the rolling rate over time. This is often done with NERF. And then we can combine everything uh, to um, uh, to have our... Uh, to, 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 to launch the training and to do the uh, testing. So we can start by loading the data set. So the, uh, which are encoded in PKL file to, get, to keep the uh, implementation short. Uh, if you're interested to know how those files were computed to understand a bit more how the rendering is done, again, there is my uh, Udemy course. I will put the link in the comment. But otherwise, if you are happy with it, uh, we just load them. Uh, then we can create our own model, uh, create op the optimizer, the scheduler, and then we can uh, feed everything in the training function. So first, we create a PyTorch data loader from the training data set, and then we send uh, everything in the training function and then we can do the testing. And you will see, so testing with the vanilla North model is very slow, but you will see that this implementation is uh, much faster. I really hope this video was helpful to you. Again, please leave a thumbs up if it was helpful. Subscribe for more uh, videos related to North, uh, and thank you uh, again.